Welcome back. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the podcast. We have another special episode highlighting the best moments from episodes 50 to 56. I appreciate all of you out there listening to the podcast. It's crazy to believe that we're finishing out 2022, and I got my Spotify wrapped analytics this year, and it said that this podcast was in the top 5% most shared podcasts in its genre. So thank you, everybody out there, for sharing, liking the podcast. You're the real MVP. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind liking, subscribing, leaving a positive Spotify rating, That would mean a lot to me and help me keep making future episodes. I'm also considering creating a podcast subscription. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but if you go to liveproducersonline.com slash podcast, there is a email form and you can fill that out. I would love to hear your thoughts or ideas on what kind of content you would like, any kind of exclusive episodes, what that might look like. If you have any ideas, please send them to me. I'm totally open to whatever thoughts you have out there. And if you want to join the email list, then you will be the first to receive updates on the podcast, new episodes, all that good stuff. You can go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. Much love to all of you listening once again. And without wasting any more time, let's jump into the best moments in these episodes with these awesome guests. So this first episode is with Tommy Z. He owns Tommy Z and Company. It's a music production house that works with some of today's largest brands, including Toyota, the Canadian Olympics team, Nike, Adidas, Google, and many others. And we have a great conversation about scoring music for TV and film and how that can make a great career for artists. Yeah, I started DJing less and less, making more and more music. But still, I wasn't sure like how that would be a full-time career because Mm -hmm. getting paid for music was quite sporadic even back then. Yeah, You do a remix here, you do a remix there, you get paid. Somebody would license your song to a compilation. We still had compilations back then, like CD compilations. It was all too sporadic, you know? And um, it wasn't until I discovered like advertising, making music for brands that I realized, okay, this like fits all the parameters that I need, which is I don't have to leave the studio. I don't have to be a star on stage. I can get paid. <laughs> paid yeah, yeah, pretty regularly. You know, once yeah. you're in a business, like it's competitive, but I would say uh, it's probably more reliable than, you know, counting on streaming royalties or things like this if you have established yourself within the business. Because mm. even if you establish yourself with streaming royalties, you have to be like some kind of a star to keep that stuff going. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like I know guys who are surviving off of streaming royalties, but you have to keep hustling to keep putting out new material yeah. uh, to, yeah. to build that up. So, so yeah, I've been there ever since, you know, since it's been 15 years. That's been my bread for the last 15 years, man. It's a long journey, but I mean, you're working with some really cool clients right now. You've got a, uh, Toyota. I saw on your site, you've worked with Honda. You worked with the Canadian Olympic team, which is really cool. That's pretty unique. Um, Animated films, a lot of different areas. What does the process look like? I'm just curious for you now, like if it's a new client or even an existing client coming to you and be like, we have this idea. What does that look like with your team and what you're doing? Most of the time, the project will come from a specific person, let's say a film director who is working with Honda, let's say on a commercial. And this film director has his choice of, you know, just like a Spielberg will choose the composer that he wants to work with for a film. It's similar in commercials in that there are different folks that are responsible for choosing the creative partners they will hook up with to create this commercial. So in some cases, it might be the film director, which is a friend of mine and he He has a campaign that he's working on and he wants to work on it with me. In some cases, it is the ad agency that represents the client that creates the commercial, that created the idea for the commercial that that they will choose or somebody within the ad ad agency, like a creative director, will choose to work with a certain music production company. And that might be me. Lastly, it might be a production company who's actually shooting the commercial. So there are like three different players that I've mentioned. Uh, In rare cases, it might be the production company. And there are various music production companies around the world that specialize in ads. Like they do not 
but do ads. And I guess I'm one of them. And so that's how these jobs come about. You know, it's really about the relationships. If you know, yeah. you know, if you know a pretty reputable film director who works on a lot of campaigns and you become his friend and you do some great work together, there's a good chance that, you know, he's going to call on back. you. What did that process look like when they're like, okay, we have this idea. Usually like, what does that look like going back and forth to try to produce and score something that works? So the process is, first of all, there is usually, though, though not always, some kind of a rough version of the film, rough edit. It's probably not going to look like the final film, mm -hmm. but it will already have like a general structure. You know, maybe the special effects are not there yet. So, but you have a kind of a working edit, a working rough footage. Usually they will already in editing that rough footage have laid up something up against that footage. So it'll be like a temporary track, an idea, uh, maybe an existing track that works really well because editors like to cut to music. A lot of editors have a hard time to just like create a structure visually without having a backing track that can set the pace, set the tempo, and even create an arc. As in like, okay, here's an intro where we draw people in and then we're going to like establish a groove to, to get people sort of hypnotized. And then we're going to hit them with a little surprise at the end, you know, like mm -hmm. a peak. So normally by the time I get this footage, there's already like a good idea of what they want uh, before you even get with the creative process going, like you have to establish, are you going to do this? Like, what's the deadline? What's the budget? Are yeah. you saying yes to it? So normally that's the first conversation that happened. I go off and I try to decide, okay, what do I need to do here? Is this something that I can do myself as a composer? Is this something where I will need to get a, specific, a very specific talent? Like uh, I have a roster of composers basically, okay. and they all specialize in different things. Some guys are really good at orchestral. Some guys are really good at electronic and orchestral. Some guys are really good at indie singer songwriters some guys are really good at like electronic beat driven sort of stuff yeah so you know i'm like a chef you know and i'm a chef and i don't necessarily cook a gordon ramsay doesn't have to cook he right. can he he's loves good. cooking yeah. but he's running yeah. a business so it's like the same for me um people go to gordon ramsay's restaurant because of gordon ramsay so i might get a project because of the relationships that i have and then the people on the other end basically trust me that the music I will make or the dishes we will cook yeah. are going to taste great. And they don't know exactly how I go about doing it. They don't know right. which composer I'm working with. They don't even care. They just yeah. care that the dish sounds uh, really good. Yeah. So that's my next step, just to line all the people, go, okay, I'm going to send this out to two guys. One I'm going to send after this particular direction. Let's do something like Johan Johansson. Sicario, edgy, electronic meets orchestral. Yeah. Then yeah. let me go after a more electronic guy, which is just going to be like sound design driven, really electronic, really goosebumpy. You just give them all the these dishes and let them kind of choose the favorite. Dishes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they say, holy shit, amazing. Like all three are fantastic, which is rare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although that's great when it happens. Sometimes yeah. they go, um, yeah, you know what? We like number one. Uh, so let's keep working on that. And sometimes they say, we don't like anything. So sometimes if they don't like anything from me, but they like something from another company, then I'm out. Uh, you know, yeah. We get paid a demo fee for just creating the demos, but... Oh, so you still get something for actually submitting? Okay. Most of the time, yeah. Uh, sometimes you don't, but that's really up to you whether you want to do it then. Right. So to give you an example, there might be a Nike commercial that comes from London, let's say. And I look at it and I'm like, holy shit, that would be amazing to work on this thing. And they're like, you know what? We don't really have budget for it, but just extending a courtesy call. If you want to pitch in, do it. If you don't, then, um, you know, talk, we'll talk to you later. Do you take that video? Do you like load that into a DAW and then start producing watching it as it's happening in real time? Like, what does that look like? There has to be a process because the problem with musicians is that, and luckily I don't have this problem 
and musicians in my business don't have this problem because we only have two days to turn around the track. Yeah, you have to work fast. Uh, you have to work fast. And so you have to have a certain process and the workflow. And that's something I teach my students uh, in the master class, but I can describe it to you very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I do is draw, drag the video into my DAW, which happens to be Ableton. I will then, the first thing I do is just sort of gauge what tempo this thing should be. Um, and so I will look at the film muted with the metronome on and start adjusting the BPM to a place where, you know, and go, mm, that's a bit too rushed, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it needs to have like a lot of power, but it needs to be slow, like 80 BPM, you know, you're looking for two things. One, can you sort of sing along in your head and create a rhythm with your mouth and it kind of feels right. But mm -hmm. the second thing is like, are the cuts in the edit more often than not lining up to this tempo? It's, it's partly like your intuition, like you're kind of like, oh man, I love the way the metronome is just falling on these cuts, the most important cuts, not every cut, but like mm -hmm. there are moments in a film that are very, very important and it has to, music should dance very elegantly during those moments. So yeah, so the chalk outline I do is I literally draw, I drop markers in uh, Ableton and say, this will be the intro. Okay, I'm watching the film. Okay, this is where the car picks up. Like, this is where you can see that the film is actually getting going. Okay, so here we will need to go into first gear. So I'll go, okay, first gear, let's run first gear for like two bars. Okay, now it's getting more dynamic. So, okay, let's do like a little fill here. I'll literally go, okay, four beats right here. I do a little fill and then go into gear four. Nice. Okay, great. Okay. And where is the climax here? Okay. It's at second 25. Okay, great. Let me just like create a ramp, build it. So I'll write like ramp, start ramp here, climax yeah. here, and then the outro, last four seconds outro. And then what I do is I take the loop brace and I literally loop the intro. I'm like, okay, I'm not worried about anything right now in the world except for solving the intro. What is the parameter of the intro? The parameter of the intro, the criteria for a successful intro is that it needs to pull you in. It needs to make room for what's about to come, but it needs to be interesting enough to pull you in. Right. So I just loop it and I'm working in a one bar, two bar loop. Uh, sending some kind of an intro, you know? And then when I'm done with that, I move my loop brace to the next chapter. When I'm done with a rough outline for each chapter, uh, it's only then that I will move on to really filling in and optimizing the emotion for that particular moment. Our field is a real career path, okay? So it's not like as if I'm here going, you know, if you just follow these three simple steps, you'll be making money and music <laughs> right. in no time. You'll be super you know? rich and life will be perfect. Oh, man, this is a tough business. And, yeah. and uh, are there musicians making a full-time living from it? Yes, and there are lots of them. And they're scattered all over the world and they work from their home studios. My piece of advice would be, first of all, raise your level of awareness about all the different ways that you can actually survive or make a living as a musician. That's the thing that kind of held me back for longer than it should have. You know, when I was DJing and I was working a day job and I was wondering like, how the hell can I survive full time? But I was, I was only thinking within the parameters that I already knew. So, okay, so I'm going to have to do, I guess, lots of remixes or I'm going to have to, you know, get a record deal or I'm going to have to sell a lot of singles. And uh, the world is so much more interesting and diverse than that. There yeah. are people literally making a full-time living from <clears throat> busking. There are yeah. like online courses about busking. Like yeah. just open your mind to new possibilities and, uh, and realize that um, there are myriad of different ways. The fundamental shift that I would say is happening is that, and I always talk about this, it's like we're back to the times of Bach. In Bach's day, like, how is it that Bach and Mozart and Handel, all these classical composers were able to survive as full-time musicians? There was no record business. They weren't selling music. How is it that they made it happen? So the, the paradigm shift that I want people to think about is instead of thinking about selling your singles for pennies 
to people who already stream it for free, not exactly sustainable. Think about selling your skills to places that have the money and are needing this uh, skill, uh, which is like creating original music that fits these commercials, for instance. Yeah. That may open your eyes to, you know, to a different way of thinking about your music career. That's Um, great advice. You can do it as a composer. You can do it as a session vocalist. You can do it as a mix engineer who only mixes right. um, music for commercials. Mm-hmm. Like there's, so there's all these different um, you know, specific functions within the world of music and brands. And uh, yeah, so there I explain how the business works. And then you, you basically know, like you write in a way, no, if you have the DNA, if you're set up that way, if this is a, a potential thing mm-hmm. for you. Also, like a short-term advice that I might give your listeners is if you create music right now, like, you know, like a lot of musicians have loops, a million loops sitting on their hard drives. I actually put my loops to really good use. It just so happened that like the stuff that I was making in the early 2000s was very, it had this commercial sensibility, but it was still quite edgy. But it started as loops, like nothing. It just loops yeah. that I was just enjoying making that gave me goosebumps. Yeah. And so what I did is I gathered all of those pieces into one folder and basically made a very simple like determination. Like, okay, which of these things do I picture in a Nike commercial or a Gatorade commercial? But I would tell like, you know, I would say to people, gather all of these loops, gather them, and then... What I did is a crea- I created a, like a 90 second, uh, really hard hitting real portfolio, I guess you could call it, like an appetizer. Yeah. But it was very seamless. It went from like slow to fast to like really edgy to like really ethereal and ambient, but it was quite effective because in 90 seconds, you basically got to know my superpower like, right. very quickly. Yeah. And, um, And so, you know, I started sending that out to ad agencies. And this is why, like I tell people, like you need to learn about how the business works before you start contacting people. Because I basically spent two years contacting ad agencies until someone told me to stop it. They said, dude, like no one's going to work with you, man. Stop sending this out to people. Really? Yeah, because like I didn't know you have to, like ad agencies don't work with individual composers. They work with music production companies. Mm. So you see, so you need to understand how the yeah. business works. As soon as I started sending that reel to like music production companies, they're like, oh, come on in for a coffee, you know? It seems you're doing some cool stuff here. That's good that's insight. What, yeah, yeah, man. That's when my career really like actually started moving forward. Yeah. Because most musicians don't ever connect it. It's like, it's so weird. It's they true. watch that's all these commercials and they're like, oh my God, that was so awesome. And then they're like, they never ask themselves, okay, where did the music come from? Yeah. Like, who actually made it? Yeah. And they don't realize that 80% of the music, I don't want to, you know, these are not exact stats. I don't right. know, but I right. can tell you that brands can't afford to only license right. famous music. That I mean, was my next thing that I was going to ask is like, yeah, obviously it's so expensive for all that licensing. I mean, why not pay somebody less than while. half to just make it? Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. most of the time the music comes from Ultimately, the music comes from some guy or girl like you and me sitting in a studio like this, mm-hmm. cranking out demos. Yep. Is uh, the concept of selling out. Like some people say, you know, making music for commercials is selling out. But I would say, apart from the argument that like some really credible musicians have done it, like Brian Eno, yeah, like everybody's doing it. I mean, I don't want to say everybody, you know, because like, Tom Waits probably didn't do it and will never do it. But there are a lot of credible musicians, like people we would not consider sellouts doing it. Apart from that argument, I would ask people to consider that maybe the worst form of sellout is to end up doing something to make money that you don't even have any passion or heart for, like getting a day job that's completely unrelated to your passion and your desire. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that is the ultimate form of selling out. Like That's good. Taking a paycheck from the man and you're not even sitting in a studio, yeah. you're sitting in a damn cubicle or a forklift yeah. or Yeah, I mean that's there's that's going to eat away your soul a lot faster 
than making I believe music so, man. for somebody I else. Yeah. So. I know right. so because I worked at a bank for five years. Me too, man. I yeah. did the same right. thing. Bad as it gets sometimes, because when you do what you are passionate about for a living, then you will feel your highs and lows a lot more intensely than when you're just working for the man. This next episode is with Maddie Harris. He is a professional mixing and mastering engineer. He's worked with a lot of major label artists. And yeah, shares a lot of cool tips and tricks on mixing and mastering. Would you say that coming from a songwriting producer background gave you an advantage moving into the full-time mixing and mastering realm? A hundred percent. Well, A, I know notes and I know keys and stuff like that. So you know, for tuning vocals and, and such things like that, that gives me an advantage right there. A lot of people just add like everything in the kitchen sink in their song because you can, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you listen to a lot of records on the radio, it's like four instruments and that's including drums. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like arrangement stuff, a lot of times, like I'll take like someone's song if they got way too much stuff in it and I'll actually mute things and send the mix back. And, you know, sometimes I take an L for doing that and it's like, dude, you're like, what happened to my song? But a lot of times it's like, man, it sounds so much better without that fucking triangle piece playing through the chorus, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like, you know, it, that's something that that is a blessing and a curse because I'll be like, I could make this so much better. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I'm the mixing guy. I consider mixing ma- mastering almost more of a service industry where I'm trying to make your song better and not be so much creative around it. So there's a fine line, like, I like to like, you know, change it enough that, that, that it makes it better, but also not take away what the artist intended or the producer intended when they made the song. You know what I mean? Sure. So, you know, there's a blessing and curse to a, coming from that production world, you know? I mean, you know, as the, the, the mixing and master engineer guys, I would say you should have someone master it just to get another set of ears, right? There's one yeah. answer. I know yeah. no one wants that answer. So right. um, the next answer would be is, is, just keep it simple. Like I use like ozone nine or whatever. We got ozone nine now. I yeah. use that all the time. That's on Me my too. master bus. You know what I mean? Oh dude, it's my favorite. I love it. And and you can get a fantastic master with that. And I'll even say that I even use the, the master button, the one that masters it for you or mm-hmm. whatever it is, the process. And then I'll go in and tweak it. Or I'll, usually I'll say that sucks and I delete it. But <laughs> um, cause I find it cuts the base too much, but that's a whole nother thing. Just but but just stick with one tool. Like I'll talk to people who have bought four thousand pl- plugins, but really don't even know how to use the EQ. Right? <laughs> this is true. And it's like yeah. so so I always tell people is like you know there's that 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 old saying of keep it simple, stupid. Just get ozone. You don't need anything else. Like you can master a song with ozone. Chris Ganger and Sterling Sound uses ozone to master yeah. major label records. Like you don't yeah. need all that shit. So, like there's so many things now, and like. I'm super guilty of as the next guy of buying all these freaking plugins that I never <laughs> end up using or I fuck up the mix by using. So like, you know, just like you got to keep it simple with stuff like that. But yeah, that's, it's, it's true. It's part of the problem of being in front of a screen is you got to turn your, there's two senses working now, right? Sure. So it's, it's not your ears, it's your eyes too. And then now we have all this visual analysis stuff can, you know, kind of throws off those two balances. So one thing I do do is, um, and this is more towards when I get at the end of a mix, when I'm kind of like, okay, am I good or not? I have two things. I have a set of speakers over in like the corner, I guess you could say, um, away from the screen. And I'll turn my chair that way so I'm not looking at the screen. And I listen on those. Because um, I've also found, and, and I'm sure other people might be able to relate to this, you like listen to a mix in front of your screen you're like it's perfect man <laughs> and then you take it somewhere and you hear every single thing that you were missing in the mix right yep yep Been and there. that to me that's that's because you're in front of the screen i don't know why but there's something mm. about it that that you're in front of the screen and you you hear it differently that's so true so, so that's one thing i do the other thing i do is just simply closing your doll like looking at the blank screen without the doll you hear things differently too. I, and I don't know why that's all like happens, but it, it happens. Yeah. It's like I can bounce a mix and then I close the doll and just play the mix before I email it, you know, just to make sure. And I'm yeah. like, wait a second. There's like four things I missed there. I'm just closing the doll, like just hide the doll, not closing it, play it from the doll, hide the doll and just like, you know, stare at your screen or whatever you're going to stare at. 
And I find you hear a lot of the stuff. So like, those are some ways I combat the eyes as opposed to just the ears, you know? I take the same approach as you. It's like anytime you're slapping an EQ on there, you're going into like either sound design or mix mode. And right. if it sounds good, it sounds good. You know, like I, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a mixing engineer, a good friend of mine, and he's worked on uh, stuff with like Eminem and a lot of other producers and artists. And he, he says like, if you're playing with something more than three times and you don't know what's up or down, you're in a good place. Just leave it alone. It probably sounds okay. You're just, you're just playing with it at that point. Yeah bass is a very common struggle, especially for a lot of bedroom producers or mixing engineers who work at home and have maybe a room that's too small. Why is that a problem? And what are some ways that you get around that or you would encourage them to get around that with mixing? Yeah, so with bass, the physics of it is bass frequencies need a lot of room to move, right? Mm -hmm. or, go, or go somewhere, right? So if you're in a small room, what happens with bass frequencies is they bounce off the back wall and then come back and bounce off the front wall and, and, and back and forth, right? Messes up the way you hear it. So the smaller the room, the worse your bass response is usually going to be, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are a couple of things that you can do to, to fix that. My room was treated. I have, you know, four foot walls, just like foam walls in the back of my room, but my bass is still not quite right because it's not, it's, it's, the room's still a little too small for like proper, proper. I use uh, what's a, it's called Trinov, which is, is like a freaking $5,000 room EQ hard computer, basically. Oh, wow. And, what's and that it, called again? It's called Trinov. And it fixes up uh, some anomalies in the room. Um, and like I say, it's five grand. It's, I don't think everyone needs it. It's super expensive. If you're mixing every day, maybe it's worth it. If you're just, you know, if, if you're not, then the other alternative that I suggest is Sonarworks. Yeah which is only about 400 bucks and works almost as well as the Trinov, except it doesn't align phase, which, you know, if you're just producing and doing some light mixing, you don't have to worry too much about with your speakers being in phase. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I really suggest, uh, I suggest that that's a great thing that can help, you know, at least flatten your speakers a bit and take some of the room equation out. Right. Um, also, if you're in a, in a bad room, check on headphones a lot. You know what I mean? There's a lot of high-end headphones now that can almost represent the same as a speaker, you know? Sure. That's the awesome. That, that kind of changed my life the most <clears throat> was what Jay taught me was mix uh, from the beginning as loud as the record's going to be at the end. What I'm saying by that is, is um, now I do, so I used to do, you know, my mix and then get it louder at the end with the limiter and all that stuff, right? That was my Same. philosophy for years. But since working with Jay, um, it's changed. And now I, I'm like, I have it set up. So within 10 minutes of my mix, I'm at like nine, negative nine lufts or negative 10 lufts or however loud I'm going to be for the mm -hmm. final delivery. Because, and this makes sense once you say it, is like, it's better to mix through the limiter, you know, hitting the thing 3 dB or whatever, so you can hear what your mix is going to sound like at the end. You know what I mean? Hmm. So like, because what happens and what would happen sometimes is you'd make this mix and man, the kicks are slamming, everything sounds dope. And then you put the limiter on and night, night, there goes the kicks, there goes the snare, <laughs> there goes all the transients you ever put into the thing, right? Yeah. So if you're not mixing with the limiter, you don't know what your transients are going to sound like. And in mm. transients are, you know, and this is also learning from Jay, transients are almost the most important part of your mix because that's what, it, you know, hits and, and attacks and makes the song sound exciting. Right. So, so, so yeah, so long story short, now I do mix with a limiter right at the beginning. Okay. Um, I'm hitting it three to four dB. And th yeah, that's that. Uh, it, I mean, I'm, I'm going through my mastering chain uh, and everything right at the beginning of my mix. What is your ideal luffs, like your LUFS as far as loudness when you're yeah. calling a song done? Like for you, what is like a good range, maybe for a certain genre? And then like, what's just too loud? What's just stupid? It's weird, man. It's right now is kind of a wild west when that with all that. <laughs> yeah. Because you have streaming, which is almost every, all the streaming platforms are now turning things down, except SoundCloud, which is like, the odd man out where it's still like just whatever. 
But the left's thing's weird, too. you got to be careful with that because your left's could be the same as another record's left's, and the other record could sound way louder because of the mid-range. So mm. left's are a good guide, but I still think if, if you're trying to get your song to compete with another song, A being is the best solution. Mm -hmm. um, but long story short, I still do look at it, and I'm usually right around negative 9 lately. Okay. Negative 8.5, negative 8. I'm starting to slowly get softer until my clients say that's too soft. Okay. Because I'd rather be able to keep more dynamics if I can um, with all the streaming stuff, you know? Right, right. So, yeah, I'm going, I'm, I've been hitting more negative nine than negative 8.5, and it's given me a little more dynamics back. And, you know, if I can get to negative 10 eventually and no one complains, that's where I'd like to be. There's a website, I think it's called loudnesspenalty.com or something like that. Google loudness penalty. Yeah. You can throw your mix in there and it will tell you how much it's going to get turned down and all the different streaming systems. Really? I'm totally going to use this. Yeah. But don't, like I said, like just use that as reference because just because it says like it's going to be turned down negative six, you know, luffs or whatever, doesn't mean you shouldn't send it hotter. You know what I mean? Because it, it's still like a little bit, it's just a reference, you know? Sure. What I do oh. suggest people do, and, and this is what I do, I, I use Tidal, but you can do this on um, Spotify too, is turn off the loudness. Um, so all of them have these things where it actually turns it down, right? But you can turn off the loudness. Uh, normal, way, I think it calls it normalization. Normalization, or yeah. God, yeah. I lose my mind. And that way you can hear the way the record was mastered, right? Sure. Um, and, and so, you know, like, just keep an eye on, on, on that. Uh, to see where you know all the records coming out right now are being sent hmm. level wise right yeah so, and everything's still probably right around where i was saying 8.59 the master right. guys haven't really changed because keep in mind too is we're used to that limited sound so if you send this super dynamic record that hasn't been limited at all it's going to sound super different you know this next episode was with the former CTO of Isotope, Jonathan Bailey. We had a good conversation about insight to how Isotope goes about releasing and creating new products for their users and his journey creating plugins and being heavily involved in music software. We put that level of passion and commitment into what we do. And maybe a positive expression is, of it is I feel just an immense gratitude for the opportunity that we have to be creating yeah. tools to enable people and inspire people to be creative themselves. Yeah. That's a real gift and privilege. And it's one mm -hmm. that I, I take very seriously. And, and as I just said, I, I, I never take that for granted. I really, I find that incredibly motivating. You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot, not everybody at Isotope is a musician or, or, or a content producer, but many of us are. And there's a funny shift that goes, I think, for most of the people who work at the company, which is a lot of people come in the door and they themselves create something like they're, they're in a band or they, they have their own music project or you know, they're, they do their own podcasting like Antoine or whatever. Yeah. But then when you work at a place like Isotope, you kind of become like a force multiplier because you go from just creating content to creating tools to allow people to create content. Yeah. And for someone yeah. like me who has the privilege of being, having kind of leadership responsibilities at Isotope, I create teams of people that create tools that enable people to create content. And so, yeah. You know, we, we kind of are, are force multipliers for the creative fabric of the universe. That's kind of how we think about it. And that's, um, that's a little bit of a mindset shift, but it's, yeah. it's no less satisfying than, you know, having your fingers on the keyboard and, and making the music come out yourself. It's, yeah. But it's different. Yeah, absolutely. When you guys have a new idea, what does that look like with your internal team to have this idea of, here's a need or this is a problem that we've heard from our user community. How do we yeah. actually translate that into being a real thing? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we could probably talk about this for the next eight hours. Or sure, let's long. do it. So I'll say this with a couple of caveats, which is one, you know, we're getting better at this all the time. I think we're, we're great at this and I think we have a lot to learn still about yeah. this. Um, but there, there are a few different ways we approach this. There's no kind of one methodology that we use to go from kind of bright idea to product in the world. So let me, let me cut it in a couple of different ways. So one, one thing we do is we're kind of looking at the market and at the competitive landscape for areas of opportunity and, and areas of opportunity that are worth pursuing, if that makes sense. So, sure. you know, so 
so we, we've kind of differentiated ourselves in the marketplace with respect to uh, you know our competitors by really by relying on kind of new technology and in many cases what I mean what we think of anyway is kind of groundbreaking new technology like solving a problem that has never been solved before or was is very difficult to solve right yeah. and um, learning from other industries how they've solved that and maybe con- kind of comparable problem spaces and applying that to audio or music production or through the technology and research and investigation work that we do internally you know, the overall market of audio production, music production is pretty big. So we break it down by different customer cohorts or, or, or different customer types. And we call those personas individually. Yeah. So we have a sense for each one of their, those personas, what the offerings are in the marketplace right now and what their sort of primary problems or pain points are. Sure. And so part of the methodology that we use is, so I'll, let's get really concrete here for a second. Let's take, let's take insight too, because... Because I'm a fan. Because you're a fan. Because yeah. you said you like it and you use it in an unexpected way. So we'll just let's just set that aside for a second. Okay. You're using insight wrong, Dan. And by oh, the way, that's I'm, great. I love I'm it. I love it. Now. I'm happy that you're using it wrong. <laughs> Thanks. Thank these you. Your creative pursuit. So our the customer that Insight Two was designed for is called Pip Pippi. Is our post production professional. Pippi yeah. is a professional, probably forty to fifty years old. Works in a studio, nine to five job. Has a background in music. Is producing audio for film and TV applications. Basically, works in Pro Tools. Uh, uses iLock most likely. So we have all of this kind of. We've built um, essentially a description of a real person, right? Right. So Pippi is right. our best attempt to kind of reflect the center of the bullseye, basically. Like, mm-hmm. what's the middle point of all of the different types of Pippies there are in the world? So we learn about our customer needs through a few different vehicles. One is we, we talk to them. We do, um, so our design team is sort of leads tip of spear along with our product management team, but we do a lot of customer interviews. So on a okay. weekly or sometimes even multiple times a week basis, we connect with customers sometimes over Zoom, sometimes in person, although well, much more over Zoom nowadays. That's awesome. And we we interview them on. We do two types of interviews with them. We do problem interviews and solution interviews. Problem interviews are we're learning from them, like what, what what's going on, like what do you need, what are your challenges right now, and so we just try and understand what's not working for them. Mm-hmm. We don't see it as our user's job to design solutions for us. That's our job. That's what that's our responsibility. Now sometimes they want to do that or they give specific suggestions or recommendations for futures and that's all good too but what we really want to know is like the why like what are you struggling with and why and what are you trying to accomplish so that's a problem interview and then the solution interview is we'll go back to a pippy and say okay we talked to you last time you said you were having trouble with you're working with uh, music on a um, tv show and the um the vocals in the music are, are, are conflicting or like you're getting some masking with the dialogue at this part of the track. What if you could pull down the vocal track and the music and emphasize the dialogue in the show? And then we come up with something like a feature called Music Rebalance, which we shipped in uh, the last version of RX, which allows you to kind of remix, you know, a song and kind of pull up, pull down. You the can vocal. isolate the bass and the vocals and the exactly, drums. Exactly. Yeah, it's very cool. I played with that. So, so, so we'll, we'll present this as a solution or even sometimes this is in like working software. This is like a paper prototype or a mock-up. You know, our, our design team uses some tools to create, um, uh, you know, uh, quasi-working facsimile prototypes of something before we go build it. So this, so so we have this whole program around customer interviews. Um, another way we learn about products, and this is opt-in, but we instrument our products for analytics. So we know what they're doing in the products, which features are being used, which features aren't being used, how much time do they spend in the various modules, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That gives us a, usually that in product analytics are really interesting because they kind of give us through the power of like large amounts of data, they can kind of give us overall trends, but they typically they give us the value is that they give us signals that we can use to inform something like a customer interview. So they, they, they reveal to us places that are worth exploring or understanding. Like we launch a feature, nobody uses it, right? We can see that. Well, then the question is, why? Yeah. And then we might learn there's a discoverability issue with it. Like people don't actually know there's a new feature there. Or we just sure. need to emphasize the new feature in our marketing. So um, yeah. we glean this from uh, user analytics. Mm-hmm. And then the we and then the last place we learn about the customers is through the, some of the more traditional means that you might imagine, which is like industry reports, you know, uh, market data stuff, th- those, those yeah. kinds of things, surveys, stuff like that. So Iris One was the first product I worked on when we 
kicked off the idea for Iris. So uh, the idea for Iris came from uh, listening to a podcast, actually. Uh, It came from the Sonic State podcast. And it was um, Dave and Chris, uh, a guy named Dave Spears and Chris McLeod from uh, a plugin company, G4 Software, if you know that company. And they make some really great emulations of synthesizers like Moog and Arp Synths and stuff like that. They have really cool instrument products. They um, also do a lot of sound design work in their professional lives and have great backgrounds as audio engineers and producers. They were using RX for sound design because the spectral selection technology in there, they were able to get some sounds that they couldn't get any other way or like the, you know, that's very powerful spectral filtering technology. And so they said on the, I think it was on Sonic Scoop podcast, they said, Isotope should build a synth out of this technology. And we heard that and we're like, oh, that's a cool idea. And so I joined and I quickly prototyped what was in the early days, it was called RX Synth. That's actually, I still have like the code lying around somewhere called oh, really? RX Synth before we came up with the RX. brand name Iris. Yep. Cool. Um, and so that's maybe, I don't know, I don't know if that's a good example or a fun example, but that's yeah. an example of where a technology that was designed for one application, it was literally designed for restoration and repair. Mm-hmm. But suddenly took it, you know, when you put technology in the hands of creative people, they use it and abuse it in all sorts of uh, unexpected ways. Yeah. And that's one of the things I love the most about this industry is where this kind of like innovation, innovative use of technology or innovative approaches to music production or creation, they come from places that you least expect. I have heard and read, and this may be, this may be apocryphal, this may be a rumor, but, um, I, I, what I understand is that AutoTune, that a foundational technology for AutoTune was actually originally uh, created for oil exploration. Have you ever heard that? No. You heard that story? Yeah, no. that's, so we'll see. That's uh, awesome. Your listeners can research that offline and you can f- message me and tell me if I'm full of it, but that's what I've heard. That's, <laughs> right. that's a scuttlebutt. Okay, that that's cool. For that application. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that. This next episode is episode 50 with Circa. He runs Entrepreneur, which is a marketing agency and educational site that teaches artists and labels how to reach fans, how to grow their following on social media, advertising, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, check it out. Like when it comes to social media marketing, what are things like I've got an Instagram page, I got a Facebook page. You know, you say you start out, you've released several songs. Like, what are things artists should be doing to grow their fan base and and monetize them? I think that, like, we can start off with, like, a kind of a dictum that might not be obvious to, like, a lot of people out there. But, like, if you value a future state for yourself that's not your current state, you should learn marketing. If you're trying to go from where you are now to somewhere different, presumably better, Learn marketing. So like, let's get that out of the way so that like, right. when I say, okay, you're a musician, you're trying to be successful, learn direct response marketing, you're not like, but I'm just a musician. No, you're a person trying to get to, from where you are to a much more advantageous place. Learn marketing, 100%. I, I'm not saying learn a campaign and pull it off for yourself. I'm not saying struggle through a training. I'm saying become sick at marketing. I can say this from the other end because actually this like last year I got an Ableton push and got Ableton. And the last time I had produced before that was on acid music studio. That's what I learned on from acid one and up. So I had no idea what like modern DAWs were like. I hadn't touched a session in like six years when I pulled that up and I took a, I took an online course and within like, Within a day or two, I was like sick at push compared to, compared to where I was, right? The reason that I was able to get back in and like work with Ableton is because I wasn't afraid to look like an idiot and I wasn't afraid to sit down with a training and like start again. And I wasn't afraid to ask my friends who, were, who knew what they were talking about. So like yeah. right there, you've got willingness to learn, willingness to fail, and willingness to put yourself in a, in a networking environment where you can source quick and specific answers. And so like when you ha- when you adopt those attitudes, you can learn very, very quickly. And if you and like it doesn't matter what it is. So like when I say learn marketing, I'm not saying like change your career path. No, I'm saying like add to your career path. Uh, sa- sample from every like every set of skills and, and knowledge bases that you like can. One of the hottest comedians out right now is Andrew Schultz. 
And the reason that Andrew Shells is so hot right now is because he takes, he self publishes all his work. So he's not waiting for Netflix to give him a fucking one hour special. He's not waiting for this or that. He yeah. puts it out on YouTube, full length yeah. specials. He puts out clips. He has clips channels. He started a podcast with Charlemagne the God. Like he's out there and he's making it for himself. And him and his team are pretty much neck and neck. He doesn't have a manager who's like knows more about it than he does. He knows just as much as his manager. His manager is helping him. So like right there, you kind of have a model for like what where we're headed. It's like if you're an entertainer, you're an independent entertainer. The the, the people who are f- like forward in that field are going to be people who are smart with marketing, who know how to market themselves. So yeah, like I I wanted to kind of get those things out of the way because like the answer is not. Oh, here's a few tips, and like yeah. you'll your social will be you'll off be perfectly and running. Yeah. No, like I'm like let this moment, this podcast episode, be the mo- defining moment where you decided to activate, and you were like, all right, enough fucking around. I didn't do my homework very much in high school. Like yep. now, I'm gonna I'm gonna make up for it, right? I'm gonna prove everyone wrong. Here's how business works, right? You need a way to get people interested and invested in your company. Let's think of that as like one bucket, right? Or your brand. You're an artist. You want people's attention and you want them to be interested, but they, they're, they're at the door, right? They're like looking in your windows. They're like, oh, this is like tight, right? But they haven't done anything yet. They haven't signed up for anything. They haven't bought anything. They're on the outside of, of your brand. Just like window shopping. and Right. You need to get people from never having heard of you to there. That's a, one system. Then you need a way to get people inside the door a way for people to sign up with you for like a one-to-one communication channel. This is a way for people to maybe buy or like spend some money on your entertainment value or something like a free offer that gets people on your email list or like a very low barrier, like low cost item, like a bracelet or like a t-shirt that gets people on your customer list. Yeah. So you need that system. And then you need a, a, a final system that, is basically responsible for delivering the experience to those customers and getting them to a place where they want to come become repeat customers. Yeah. Every business has these three systems. Sometimes they're built out with more nuance, like nine systems, but they all can be kind of comprised into these like three buckets. What would you say to a person that was like skeptical about just starting to launch ads for Facebook, Instagram, their social channels as an artist? I used to live in a recording studio that was also the main production studio for AO the producer. It's a Grammy winning producer, right? I had tons of friends who were like getting record deals. My buddy's a manager. He's getting kids on like festivals and stuff. I'm a musician. I was doing pretty good in terms of networking. Did I have to run ads to build my business? Like I knew tons of musicians and I had lots of like cloud at the time. Did I need to run ads? No, probably not. The different, the thing about ads though, is that, They run on a schedule with a budget. So the result that you need this week, guaranteed to come in this week, if the system performed last week up to those expectations, chances are this week it's going to do the exact same thing. Now, like the other day, I got a DM from like an amazing rapper who I never in a million years thought would like be following our shit, right? It was dope. But can I rely on that? Like, is that going to happen every day? No, it took three years of building and running ads for something like that to happen. But the ads are going to run tomorrow. They're going to run today. I know that they're working. So the the point of marketing is to build these three systems for your business in a way that's reliable and predictable. Mm -hmm. Because if you can predict the outcome of a system, then when you augment the system, when you tweak it a little bit and there's a change, you don't you know that that's not random you know it's because of the the tweak that you made but if yeah. everything if every result in your brand and in your your career comes from random phenomena you can't attribute it back to a specific action so you're doing every fucking thing that you can just to catch your own ass you know yeah, yeah. you're just like doing a million things at once yeah, yeah yeah there's only enough time in the day and we can't time travel yet you're, you're doing some organic social posting, right? And you're like, yo, new song out now, check it out. And then there's a Spotify link and an iTunes link and like a Deezer link and then like your YouTube link and all these links. And no one clicks any of them. And the reason is, number one, the, the look at the goal of a post like that. New single out now, right? 
who are you trying to talk to? You're trying to talk to your fans, right? Yeah. Now, that probably one of the probably one of the least reliable ways to reach out to your fans is to throw like huck a social post out into the ether, right? Yeah. Reach is not absolute. It's not guaranteed that they're all going to see it. They're busy. They have shit going on. It's one. It's not only one touch. Like it's one attempt at a touch, you know. So it's never going to yield much. There's a lot of people who are doing that kind of stuff actually want more fans. You're not going to get more fans from your limited reach of your limited, you know, like social following from one post. Like that's never going to happen. Furthermore, you're just littering in people's newsfeed. Like no one cares. <laughs> the, the people who care already know it's out. I'll put it that way. They already know. They've been anticipating it. The people who are actually going to click a link like that probably already know. And that's why a lot of the music industry advertising sucks. Cause it's like, uh, I, at the CD baby conference, I, I, I had like the day before I looked up ads that were running for Lil pump. Cause I know he probably has some gigantic music industry, digital marketing firm that like doesn't know their head from their ass. Yeah, and I was I, like, I remember, I remember that you did some examples. Right. Probably. And so the ad said Pookie remix out now. And it's like, all right, this is an ad. They're spending money to reach people. Yeah. Might be people who, like, so, okay, two types of people, you know, who Lil pump is and you love his music, you know, who Lil pump is and you hate his music or you've never heard of Lil Pump. Now, if you love his music, you already know the Pookie remix is out. This ad is useless. If you hate his music, this ad isn't going to convert you. It's useless. And if you don't know who he is, they're guaranteed to alienate you. They've given you no contextual information as yeah. to why you should give a fuck that the Pookie remix is out now. Yeah. Like, who cares? Yeah. So that's a major problem that people have with their ads. So really, the, if you want to run good ads... To consider the following things. What is a very specific goal that you want to achieve with this ad? And it can't be like, all right, I need more fans. Like that's not like how many more fans, where do you want them to come from? What stage of awareness are they in? How will you consider right. them to be fans? Like how will you know when you've succeeded? So consider the specific goal and then find a way to limit the audience of the ad to the specific people that you actually want to talk to for that goal and then create an ad, which like the sole focus of that ad is to bring people from that stage of awareness that you identified they're in to the next, to the goal stage. You know, yeah. right now we have ads running that will bring someone from never having heard of us maybe to purchase something that's like roughly like $20 to $40. Right now, that maybe one out of like 2000 or one out of 3000 people does that like only two out of every hundred who actually like click do that. Right. It's like a 2% conversion rate. Yeah. So because I'm moving them from never having heard of us to having heard of us to having received some free value from us to having learned about a product of ours and being interested to, in it, to making the decision to buy, to actually going through the checkout process all in one ad. That's like eight stages or nine stages, right? That's a lot of touches. The more stages that you put into, the more stages that you're supposed to traverse with your audience in a given marketing campaign, the less people are actually going to make it to the end. The more, the more difficult it's going to be, the more costly it's going to be. And the only way to get more costly than like every stage possible is to not even select a goal for your ad, which is kind of what they did with that Pookie remix out now. A business can do that. Give you some free information, buy leads through ads, offering this free information, and then follow up with them via email and retarget them with custom audiences and get them to buy the thing. Mm -hmm. That's They can do that. Musicians can't because we, we're not solving your arachnophobia. We're not fixing your kitchen sink. You know, We're not building you a dresser. We don't solve like, like very tangible problems like most business owners. Yeah. We actually have to build an audience that is like a fan of us, which means system one needs to be way more nuanced. How we get people to start actually looking in the window and like paying attention to us needs to be way more nuanced than a business. A business can just go out, target people who have arachnophobia, say, Hey, you got arachnophobia. You're like, yes, I do. And they're like, all right, I'm going to solve it for you. And you're like, all Sick. Your life problems are over. yeah, we can't go out there and be like, no. you a fan of the crystal method. Well, check us out. Like, no, that no right. one's going to care. You're selling a feeling really with your music. Totally. An archetype. You're, you're selling a mode of being that is archetypal. It's like a character in a movie, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. And so 
Instead, what we're attracted to, the things that go viral, is like stupid human tricks or like yeah, my best friend's talented. Talk. Yeah, like basically when we stop in the feed when we're being addressed or when from the first like millisecond of seeing the ad, we get the impression or the post rather. Let's call it a post because ads are posts. And if you don't make them look like shitty ads, no one will feel like they're ads. So let's call it a post, right? That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like banner, like just ad blindness, I think. Right. This is called yeah. this is called native advertising, what I'm talking about here, which is advertise, make your ads like the content that's native to the platform anyways. So when you think about viral videos on social, it's usually someone like, oh, uh, like, okay, let's take Walmart Yodel Kid, right? <laughs> this When you see a kid in a bow tie and his little jeans, his little outfit in Walmart, yeah. And it's clear that he's singing. You know it's not because you're going to be bored by it. You're either going to laugh because he's terrible, or you're either going to just be blown away. So the context of what you see in that first few seconds actually matters a lot for your presuppositions about what the video is going to be like. Totally. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that, that's like, you want your ad to feel like native content. Like it's just on the platform, like you stumbled across it rather than you know, an ad because in music, especially we need discovery to actually like artists. I'm much less likely to like an artist that my friend recommended to me than I am to like that same artist. If I found them in a way that's separate from my social circle, I'm a hipster and I just found this cool thing that no, right. Cause you can go back to your social network and say, y'all heard of this dude. Oh, well I found him, you know, he's sick. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's true. That's why I love my Discover Weekly Spotify playlist because I'll find somebody and share it with my friends and it makes me feel right. Weird. Now, here's an important thing to realize about that. Why does it feel cool, right? Like, do your friends give you money when you tell them about a new artist? I wish they did. There's no tangible reward for being the first one to have heard about this artist or at least not having heard of it from someone else. But what it signals to the rest of society is that you're like a unique dynamic individual and it elevates your status. Now I want everyone listening to think about how does this event elevate the status of the person I'm trying to talk to? Because when we're out there online and I mean this, like I'm not just bullshitting here. I'm not just saying this to be hyperbolic. The only thing we're looking on for online is an elevation of status. That is it. So this next episode is episode 55 with Bad Snacks, and she shares some insights to her creative process producing, and yeah, check it out. Like you've got some hype, and then you've got some stuff that's a little more chill and kind of laid back, and I think that's that's what a good producer does, is you, you create a set, you create a mood, because if you're just like bangers 24-7 all day long, you know, people... Do- right. People do have chill moments and then they have more hype moments in their life. And that makes for a great set playing live too. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, and I think, I think a lot of it kind of comes from um, my background in classical music, honestly, because classical music is potentially the most dynamic style of music in existence. <laughs> yes, this is true. Um, I think that's, that's stayed with me in some way or another of just like, yeah, that is par- always part of the memo is like, you know, what kind of journey are we going on? And, and I, and I um, specifically crafted this beat tape to have, um, you know, a, a contour to it, like to have a storyline to it. Like there's a reason why the tracks are in the order that they are. You know, one of the most important things that you can do as a producer is to, first of all, create every day if you can but also to set assignments for yourself every day. So whether that assignment is being like, okay, I heard this sick drum drum feel on this D'Angelo record and I want to re-emulate that in some way or another. Or, or if it's like, oh, like for right, right now, I'm trying to work on like my diminished voicings and augmented voicings and trying to incorporate that into more of my production. But it could also be nice. about sound design. So I try not to make it too predictable, but yeah, I mean, if there were like a typical day where it's like, okay, Jess, you got to like make something up on the fly, then it would be like, okay, start with drums, then grab my, um, I have like a Rhodes patch that I have ready to go because I find that it's just the easiest way to just get chords out. And then I would put a baseline to it, format it, 
uh, you'd think that as a string player, I would put strings first or close to first, but honestly, strings are one of the last things that I do <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with well, any track. And you layer them a lot with I do. like your synths and other things. I noticed that you do a lot of yeah. harmonies and like really cool mm -hmm. melodies and just layering that sound design together. I feel like sound design is, is so ambiguous, it's so subjective that a lot of producers okay. starting out and my students like really get lost in the sauce of being able to do that kind of stuff well. And a lot of that is ear training. And I'd say you're a great example of somebody who does a really good job with layering those sounds together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, you're totally right. It like sound design is a completely ambiguous term. Um, and one thing that um, I talk about a lot is uh, how I think about sounds in textures really work well together. Like what, what are the textures that are going to be like popping through a mix? What's going to blend well? What's going to support the bottom? What's going to fill out the mid range? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Like one of my favorite sayings is like, don't clog the toilet of sound. Cause it's so easy to do. It's like, it's like I'm <laughs> missing something in this track. So let me just shove more stuff into it. It's like, yeah. no, dude, you're literally Don't just going to cause, you're going to ca cause so many problems for yourself. You know, you don't have to feel like all of your ideas are great in order to just do something because, you know, as long as you're making something every day, you're, you're making progress. Um, and even if your beat is complete ass is like, if you, if you discovered at least one setting on a plugin, that's a good day. You know, it kind yeah. of ties into this whole, um, idea uh, that I've been working with, which is just the no zero days concept of just, as long as you're working on one thing every day could be as small as answering an email could be as big as finishing up a track or releasing a record as long as you're doing one thing every day that's a good day and you can feel good about that for independent artist company called entrepreneur a guy named circa he was on the podcast not that long ago but he was talking about plans are worthless but planning is essential i like that when you plan very, very far in advance, what does my career look like in five years or even 10 years? What does my life look like in 10 mm -hmm. years? And then reverse engineering from there. Love it's that. kind of like a nice exercise in like dreaming, but also planning of being like, what does that look like? Okay, yeah. let's say that in 10 years, you know, I, I catch a, a major sink on a Grammy winning record. How did that happen? Well, it happened because I worked with this artist. And how did that happen? It's because I worked with this artist and worked with this publishing company. And I got that publishing company's attention by putting out this record. You know, yes, it's just like, totally those little things. It's just of, of kind of like looking at the end goal and then working your way backwards to where you are now. And sometimes just mm -hmm. conceptualizing what those steps look like can be a real game changer. I like using percussive loops and shortening the transients of them um, mm. just through the uh, beats thing. Through Like warp mode? Like a like the beat? Yeah, mode? Like, like pull back the transient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then throwing that through corpus, um, picking oh, nice. a tone. And then using the Max for Live LFO to automate out a resonator so that these chords kind of blossom open. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah. brilliant hack. I don't use the corpus enough, so I'm really excited to hear that, honestly. This next episode is with Steve Primo. He runs the company Savant Playback, and they build a lot of playback rigs for large events um large tours with major major label artists and yeah we nerd out really hard in this episode so anybody who wants to go deeper into setting up playback rigs for live performance or wanting to get into automated cameras or lighting and visuals for their shows then uh, this is the episode to check out for sure especially with the way that graphics cards are now it's getting like some of the stuff that you can do, um, the augmented reality stuff is just like, holy crap. It's pretty wild. Yeah. So I definitely see some like some really cool stuff in the future for concerts and stuff. Um, for sure. And live streaming services, for sure. You could just I, get a Resolume feed in there somewhere and just make people trip out. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Something. The, uh, I use uh, Notch quite a bit. Uh, I haven't gotten into Unreal Engine, but Notch is a really cool platform that allows you to do uh, real-time rendering same kind of it's not a gaming engine like unreal but um, the website is notch.1 so o-n-e it's a really cool program they uh they use it a lot in like live imag effects and stuff like that but it's a 3d um, a real-time 3d workspace so you can do like particle simulations fluid like all kinds of crazy stuff like that That's but awesome. i'm gonna check that out when we hang up
Yeah, it's a really, really cool program. They use right. it on uh, a lot of the larger tours and stuff, like where you see like DJ Snake, and he's got like these insane visuals where it's like him and his body outlined and like particles okay. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can do like a connect camera with it, so you can like interact with screens and you can move your hand from left to right, and it makes like particles move and clouds and stuff like that. So oh, that's um, it's, awesome. yeah, it's a really cool program. Same, similar kind of thing as uh, Touch Designer. Unreal Engine or Unity or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, like common issues for playback engineers. Like this is a a, a full time job that's really become a like a bigger reality. I think for a lot of people in the last several years. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, you you know, you can't step onto a, a large format stage or even like a mid level touring you know stage and them not have some form of playback, whether it's just strictly time code um, for lighting, or if maybe they have click tracks, maybe they have count ins. You know, pop acts are running. You know, some of them are running thirty two tracks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely grown. I think one of my things that I'm focusing on is I don't feel that playback. And you know, I've been doing it like six, eight years. There's people that have been doing it like way, way longer than I have for sure. Yeah. But I feel like this is a time, um, even with everything going the way that it is with streaming and stuff like that, I think that it's a time where playback is becoming like its own entity and an industry of itself, as opposed to it's always kind of been either lumped in with backline or it's kind of been lumped in with like audio. And when you're on tour, it's kind of that way. But you're you know, it's getting to the point where the systems are controlling more, they're doing more. I Kind of our goal is to be able to make it to where people are like, this This is its own industry. It's not just, it's yeah. not just like, oh, it's a couple computers you throw in a backpack and stuff. Like when it gets to the point um, that your show is reliant on it, it needs to be thought of as something that's just as important as an audio console or even you know your tour bus like you know if the tour bus doesn't work you don't have a show if your playback rig doesn't work you probably might have a show but you're not going to have synchronized lights like your lighting guy you know lighting pyro video it's like it's literally one of the most important elements of the show so if it's not treated that way yeah um, and i say it a lot it's like it's not a problem until it is making making sure that uh people take this stuff as seriously as they should too because right. a lot of people out there are like rocking like macbook airs and they're like yeah it's fine i got like you know my grocery list with my notes and stuff like that on there and like <laughs> their friends are getting like notifications and stuff while they're playing keyboards and stuff uh, yeah what other like audio interfaces do you stand behind or love to use so I've worked with iConnectivity for a long time. They've um, they actually kind of brought me on. So when I was doing my first playback system with uh, with Chase Rice, I needed to be able to do a MIDI, and I needed to be able to have the playback system off to the side of the stage, and I needed to have the drummer be able to be, you know, a hundred feet away. Uh, so they were one of the first companies I really started working with in depth because they have network MIDI, still kind of the leader of, you know, network MIDI. Um, and back, I think that rig is even that first rig that I did is probably still the, the first network I set up is still out on that tour. Instead of having to go into like audio MIDI setup or your network preferences and like create a network every time it saves the network to, you know, both of the interfaces, um, which is really nice. We also use RME uh, for a lot of yeah. stuff for Maddie and Dante systems. Uh, we like to use RME. The uh, direct out stuff is really nice. Their switchers, uh, the Xbox MD is really nice. And then the Xbox BLDS is really nice. Okay. They also have like a, a much larger format unit that's called like the Prodigy series. So they've got an MC and an MP, really, really high end uh, converters and stuff like that. But they uh, those boxes are like a 2U, but they actually have uh, modules in the rear. So you can do wave sound grid network. You can do Dante. You can do Maddie. Nice. You can actually nice. do. So they've got 
mic and line input cards and output cards. So you can, um, you know, it's a modular configuration. So you buy like a chassis and the chassis is X amount of dollars. And then as a touring playback guy, you can have a handful of cards and whatever the tour calls for, if they want, you know, redundant Dante or they want, you know, Maddie, or you may have, you know, mic inputs that you need for yeah. vocal processing or something. It's yeah. all encased in, in one unit. So they also use those for like front of house processing and stuff like that. Yeah, well, we were talking about lighting a little bit, and then I kind of ended up like throwing you into a different rabbit trail of thought. But oh, like, yeah. the light, the lighting stuff, I mean, you were starting to talk about some of the newer things that you were doing with that. Yes. Uh, I, this year, I plan to focus a lot on video integration, and we've built some lighting stuff, too. Lighting stuff is... Um, we've used the DMX stuff quite a bit, and it's really mm -hmm. simple for... Um, it's really simple for people to get into um, like a pretty decent, like small club size, like lighting rig, be able to program it um, and be able to take it out and, you know, have kind of like an all in one kind of guy. Like I'll see a common thing will be like a smaller band that'll have like a production or tour manager that will do playback, but also has a little bit of programming experience and will do you know, set up some a, a little lighting rig for them, and they'll have some some LED bars down front, um, and then uh, you know, Resolum integration and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. My my kind of my kind of path for Savat playback is to continue down the like what I consider modular touring packages, which is where um, you have you know a Pelican of whatever size that's your playback, a Pelican that has you know your video system a pelican that has your lighting all of these systems are thought out to where you know power runs from device to device um, all of them talk to each other um, you can control them from multiple positions and then they can also be scalable to where if you do have a lighting guy um, that has a grand ma3 or something like that you can give him control of the DMX plugin if you're on a small format tour or, you know, scaling up even to where, um, I mean, really, if you go from DMX, if you go from that level, the next level is just going to time code and running a time coded out show, which you can still do in a small format. You can use like Grand MA on PC and you can run it from side stage and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't have to be like a... Uh, you know, a full size like lighting console out sure. front or something. There's a lot of work you know, Like our session template, I created, I created um, 28 different click samples, and I actually synthesized them um, using Serum. And I went in and I made them. Um, I made them each key, and then I made the accents in a perfect fifth of that. That's brilliant. Um, so there's 28 different click samples that you can so the key of the track, so that you can make the 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 click either be, and it can be something that's not in the same key, um, so that it specifically is non harmonically, and so that it doesn't blend in. Um, but I went in and I was like, all right, I don't want like. Because all the like wood block and all these samples that I found just suck. It's annoying after a while. Uh, they just all like they were like dull and they weren't. They just weren't good. So I went in and made. I used Serum for it. I mastered all of them. Um, and it's we use a click. Uh, we use a drum rack for that. Yep. So, so the cool thing about it is if you take you know a click track here, um, we use a drum rack for clicks. Um, we use a drum rack for slates. Um, and then song titles. And that way, all you have to do is um, on your timeline, wherever you're going to have it, you just draw in one, two, three, four. And then anytime that you need a count in, you highlight that, hit Apple E, Apple C to cut, copy. And then any place that you drag that, because it's MIDI, it's mm -hmm. automatically perfectly on tempo. Right. So click tracks, you can literally, like I've seen people sit there on Digital Performer and they take like a piece of audio and they like put their grid to like quarter note and then they place one and then they place another one and then they zoom in to make sure it's right. And like, oh, that sounds awful. And like, I'm like, I hit Apple B and I just draw like 32 bars and then I'm like, Apple yeah. C, Apple B, Apple C, Apple B. Shortcuts for the win, right? Honestly. 
Yeah. Yeah. We, we, uh, we, uh, using MIDI stuff like that. Um, I do the same thing for my yeah. life. That's yeah. I was trying to get, so we had the black magic ATEM, um, studio pro HD, which accepts OSC. And I was trying to get, just trying to send, um, and I was using Oscillator and then OSC sender um, to send the uh, camera changes to the video switcher. Oh, so nice. you can use, you can use yeah, so you can use MIDI notes that you can convert MIDI to OSC, which then sends OSC messages to a video switcher that can take network. And I was like, oh, this is freaking amazing. I clicked on something and. I saw a MIDI note pop up in Ableton and I was like, wait a second. So I had so, like somehow in my crazy like networking managed to find an Easter egg to where I turned the video switcher into a MIDI controller that would send OSC into Ableton. So it was like the craziest thing because awesome. it was, it's a, you know, they've got a 4K version which is eight SDI 4K inputs. And then they've got um, an HD version, which is just 1920 by 1080. And it has four SDI inputs and four HDMI. But both of them can be put, um, both of them can send and receive OSC messages. There's a thing on uh, GitHub and it's called, it's an application called Oscillator. Yeah. But you can, um, you can, and then there's that, and there's the the missing link between all of them. It's called ATEM OSC, so it's A T E M, and then OSC. So you have to have like five applications open to make it all work. But um, <laughs> you can literally sit there, you can listen to the band, and you can program camera changes while using the video switcher, um, and you can record those into Ableton, and then you just reverse the send and then it sends ableton um it, or ableton sends the osc to the video switcher but you can control crossfades between cameras That's um, you can control like you know fade to black all kinds of stuff like that that could be really powerful if you're doing a live stream recording of a band show or something oh yeah absolutely so this next episode is episode 56 with Mari Go. Mari is an Ableton certified trainer, and she, during the pandemic times, made a living off of Twitch streams. So she is a streamer, a performing artist, live looper, producer, and we talk about her live streaming setup, amongst other things, in this episode. So, yeah. Do you have, like, a typical chain that you build for your voice? Like... You don't have to go into super detail, but maybe for people who are just curious, like can't really get a good sound out of my voice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that it takes a while to get that down for sure. Um, I mean, I would say I probably don't even have it as good as it could be, but honestly, live performances for Twitch, I use a condenser mic. But um, yeah, so basic chain. I mean, obviously, there's a number of compressors on there um, to smooth yeah. things out. Um, I like. Um, let's see, what do I use? I like the fab filter compressor. Mm, I like Yes, the Pro C. Yeah, I use the Waves Arvox sometimes. Um okay. the glue, Ableton's glue compressor is yes. great too. Yeah, so I'll use those um for sure. I always uh obviously cut all the lows out of my voice. And I find that that's actually a really important step to finding exactly where you should cut the lows. So like right. definitely play around with that and don't just be like, yeah, I'm going to chop it at 100 and leave it, you know? Also, for different songs, it might be a different low cut level, right? So, sure. I mean, for female vocals, for my voice especially, I find like a good high shelf really brightens it up, sounds awesome. But then mm -hmm. I have to be very careful about the harshness coming out or the S's. So, I definitely also have a bunch of like DSing tools. You if know, you like, had to pick one DSing tool, what would it be? One? Oh, uh, gosh. You know what? I think that the built-in DSer in the Nectar. I actually did a webinar yesterday on that, so I'm really? ex I'm excited to hear oh, you funny. say that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I like you know the the Nectar Suite has so many things. I'll throw it on just for that DSer. Dude, so I'd wild. say if I had to pick one, I have like eight different things that I use. But if right. I had to pick one, that one is pretty dang good. Yeah, I bought like the Waves DSer, and I think the. I like the isotope one. The Nectar one is, is better, I think. Ableton has a, a DS preset uh, as a compressor um, that I'm, 
I've used before, but it's not my favorite. So yeah, I, I've I've found that uh, that one doesn't quite work for me, at least for my voice specifically. It's not right. right. Yeah, I'm just giving you like what works for my voice, but but yeah, like vocal chains are very specific. Mm-hmm. You know how much how much to compress. How, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the, the S like your S's, everybody's S's are in a different frequency range. Like they're all close, but like, yeah. it's just slightly different than the next person. So it's definitely tricky. Anyway, just to finish that off, I love Valhalla vintage verb mm-hmm. on vocals. Also the, uh, convolution reverb max for live. Sounds great. What else? Yeah. Have you played with Valhalla's new super massive plugin? I just downloaded it yeah. yesterday. I haven't used it yet. I'm excited. It's fun. It's fun. It's like Vintage Verb had a baby with the uh, like shimmer or or uh, like frequency echo. It's weird. Cool. Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah, I'm excited about that one. Is there yeah. are there, is there like a delay function in there? Yeah. yeah. So it, okay. yeah, it, it's it's a little bit of a hybrid of things. But for anybody who's like a producer who wants to maybe get started doing what you do. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things they need to think about if they want to start live streaming their performances on Twitch? It's just like a totally different game. Like it's, it takes a while to get your setup going for sure. Like I feel like it took me a year to get a setup that I really feel good about. Like, yeah. so I'll talk streaming stuff and then the music stuff. So Perfect. for the streaming, I'm using OBS uh, or Streamlabs OBS. I, I was using regular OBS before. I recently have just tried out they're basically the same. One just has more stuff going on. But yeah. um, so OBS or Streamlabs OBS will work fine. And um, I have a two computer setup. I built with my uh, partner who's a super nerd. Uh, we built my streaming PC together. We built it, you know, it's not anything crazy specific specs, but we just made it powerful enough to be able to like handle the load of streaming. So I've got OBS on the PC. And then on my Mac, which I have my MacBook Pro, I've got Ableton and all of the audio stuff is happening through the MacBook as if it would be just my live performance set up at a show. Right. And then I just have the interface that's connected to my Mac, the output going into the input of the one connected to my PC. And so all of my audio is just being bussed basically to OBS on my PC, which is handling all the streaming. Just to reiterate for everybody listening and for my own sanity, like you have one laptop and that's just your music laptop that's just running Ableton. And then you have an interface with that that's outputting to another interface going into just your streaming computer, right? Correct. With NDI. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, so on a normal stream day, I don't really use the NDI. Okay. NDI is only if I want to share my Ableton set on my Mac. So it's right. like, for teaching like, okay, purposes. Yes, for teaching. So it's working on my Mac, then like how would my share my screen on OBS on the PC? What I'm using is the NDI scan converter. Um, is that new tech? Is that new tech? Who makes that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And gotcha. With a K T E K. So I have the scan converter, which then picks up my screen and through the internet, you know, casts it to OBS on the PC. Right. And that does get a little bit shady at times. It's like sometimes there's some a lot of frame dropout, but um, but for some just like basic Ableton stuff, it it works pretty well. Yeah. So you built this, or you and your partner built this like nicer PC computer. Uh, like, do you when you were building that out, did you have like a specific level of specifications that you wanted, such as like it has to have this much RAM or like this much yeah. processing power? What does that look like? What are you using? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we've got um, an eight core AMD processor in there, 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, we got from video game friends, someone donated <laughs> a good graphics card for me so I could do some gaming. <laughs> it's, good. <laughs> it's good to have friends. Those are good friends yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to like buy a really nice, yeah. I'm not, I'm not like a huge PC gamer, but I do like to do a little bit of PC gaming. Yeah, definitely like the RAM and the, and the processor are the most important things. And then, um, yeah, you know, we've got a solid state drive, which of course now is standard. Yeah, that's the basic specs of that PC. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and then as far as like the music side, it's basically the same setup as I use for live performance. So the Nord Push 2, I've got Ableton running, I'm recording into clips. Um, I've got like very specific chains that I use on everything. I have some 
like audio effect racks that I put on like everything that just have simple effects like reverb delay that I can just like instantly create an interesting sound out of like a basic sound. So I don't have to do a lot of designing in the, you know, like slowly designing things in real time. So I have tools to make it a quick performance, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And you want to make your computer happy and not cry. So it's like that balance of like, how much do I put into my yes. actual project before that little CPU load meter starts like spiking your computer sweating? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not using a ton of plugins for this. Yeah. Um, for for uh, Twitch or for just live performance in general, a lot of built in stuff. Anyway, I, I want to do this before I forget. I just want to give give a shout out to Ableton for I think really taking a very active position and trying to get more women yeah. uh, trainers and just involved and like featuring more women, like as artists who are performing too. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, I think like five years ago, you know, until this round of certifications, there was one female trainer in the U S and it's Laura. Yeah. And, um, and I, I can, I can tell from like, you know, having a relationship with them that like, it is something they're actively doing. It's cool. And they're just trying, I think they're trying really hard. And part of the reason there's not very many is because it's like only so many women are applying to be certified trainers. And then the standard is so high and they're not willing to compromise, which I don't think they should. Um, But it's sort of that earlier step of like education of like offering, offering this and showing women who are doing it. And I think that they actually are trying really hard to do that. I and I, I felt very supported by them in the certification process and like encouraged by them to do it. And I was not, I was a hundred percent sure that I was not good enough. Oh no. Well, you totally are. I yeah. mean, that's... But that's how I felt when they were like, maybe you should try this. And I was like, Oh no, like that's yeah, no way. <laughs> that, that's cool though. I mean, you're right though. It, I have so much respect for the company in a lot of different ways. And when I was getting certified about the same time you were, I think your class might have been right after us. Or not class, but your group. Yeah. We had two women and then there was three of us guys. It was a group of five, which I think is bigger than normally it is. I'm not sure. But but yeah, there was two other girls and they were killing it and they knew what they were talking about. And yeah. I, was le- I was learning things from them, just like chatting a- outside of the sessions we were having during our testing. And I was just like, man, there's so much to learn. It's good. Yeah, always, always. So anyway, I just want to say that I really appreciate that from Ableton and they, it makes me happy. (laughs) Yeah, no, totally. It's a great company, great group of people. Big thanks to everybody who was on this podcast. And once again, if you want to connect with me, um, I would love to hear feedback on how maybe I can improve this podcast. Get your thoughts on this potential subscription idea that I had releasing unique episodes or exclusive content if you have any thoughts ideas suggestions comments please hit me up you can reach out at liveproducersonline.com slash podcast just scroll down to the bottom where it says suggest new guests there's an email form you can just hit me up there so yeah appreciate everybody listening and have an awesome week go make some hot tracks and i will see you in the next episode check back on tuesdays for new episodes right now i'm releasing every other week Have an amazing holiday season and I will see you very soon.